Hi, my name is Devi Sridhar. I'm a professor at the University of Edinburgh, and I'm here to answer your questions on the coronavirus outbreak. So the first question I had was, um, could anyone foresee that this was going to happen? I think that we've been talking about something called disease X for a while. So some kind of novel, whether it was an influenza or some kind of virus or some kind of drug resistant infection that would usually come from crossing over from an animal to human and then spread rapidly around the world. And so, yes, it's been at the front of the public health community's mind that one of the greatest threats to us would be this kind of virus or bacterial infection spreading around. The next question is, do we know where this originated from? And the truth is we still don't. Um, coronaviruses are usually in bats, so it's likely that was the host reservoir, the first animal. But there likely was an intermediary animal, and it's unclear what that was before it made the jump into humans. We also don't know how long the virus has been circulating and whether it's been circulating just from December or even late December, which is what we initially heard from the Chinese government, WHO, World Health Organization, or whether actually transmission was occurring already in October. And right now, it seems like there's so much focus on policy response and managing it that there's not as much been attention on where did this actually come from and who was patient zero. The next question is, were the experiences of SARS and Ebola helpful in planning for coronavirus? And I think the answer really depends what country you're in. So if you're in West Africa or let's say Senegal, um, I think Ebola was incredibly helpful because they moved really quickly in January to try to acquire rapid diagnostics, to work quickly to implement societal shutdowns, to try to get the virus under control. And the memory of Ebola is so vivid there that actually you saw much rapid a more rapid response than we have in the West. Also, citizens are less complacent because they know what infectious disease outbreaks can do. I think this is also true in East Asia. The memory of SARS is scarred into the, um, the memories of people in Taiwan and Hong Kong. So they moved incredibly quickly as well on their own, sometimes even before government, to actually ensure that they were taking strict hygiene measures and that they wouldn't catch the virus. The same is true for South Korea, which was criticized for its handling of MERS, or Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, and so this time around didn't want to repeat the same mistakes. The WHO, the World Health Organization, also reformed its health emergencies program and is now communicating much more clearly than it has in previous emergencies, putting out um, daily situation reports and having um, a team trying to work on supply chains to make sure test kits are getting across the world and that they can have an operational role in emergencies and not just a technical one. So I think, yes, we have learned those lessons in certain parts of the world and in the WHO. The next question is, how would I judge the national response? And I really think this depends on what country you're in. This has really revealed that each country has a unique health system, a unique political system, and a unique societal response in terms to how do you deal with a crisis and emergency. In the UK, I think we've been quite complacent and we've been quite slow to react. And so I wonder whether we could have taken measures much earlier to stop the spread through actually continuing to test people, continuing to trace contacts, and basically try to break chains of transmission instead of just assuming everyone will get it. In the United States, it's been a whole different set of factors having to do with first denial about the virus existing, to then comparing it to the flu, um, to now mixed messages coming out from different parts of government and a lack of coordination um, across that. And what you've seen is actually local government becoming important and different governors and mayors coming forward to take their own measures in the absence of federal leadership. The final question is, what do I see as the outcome? Um, I'm going to optimist. I'm going to give the best case scenario, which is that we rapidly have a diagnostic, like a point of care diagnostic, meaning people can have swabs in their mouth and know within hours whether they have the virus because asymptomatic carriers are a large percentage of those carrying the virus. And so just isolating people who are symptomatic seems to be missing a lot of the transmission. So if we can have that and then hold out in time to get an antiviral in place, it looks like we're going to be repurposing some other medicines we have towards this to get a good antiviral cocktail cocktail that doctors can use across the world, and then holding out time for a vaccine um, in the coming year. A vaccine will probably not be ready before a year's time, a year to year and a half. But until then, if we can mix um, other kinds of interventions, like a rapid diagnostic and a treatment, as well as trying to stem the spread of the virus, um, all these together could hopefully lead to the least possible loss of life, which is the ultimate goal. We want the least um, number of people dying from this and the most number of people getting the care they need so that nobody is dying because they haven't gotten adequate medical care.